Dana White's taking a hell of a step. And he tried to do this about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And senators applied pressure to ESPN and Disney. Disney said, you're not doing the, these cards in California in the guts of the pandemic. So they pulled the plug. It's a month later, or less than a month later. They're in Jacksonville Saturday. They're in Jacksonville next Wednesday. They're back in Jacksonville a week from Saturday. Three cards in less than a week. It kicks off with UFC 249 this coming Saturday. And... It has got a lot of people talking, and it feels like it's going to happen. Ariel Hawani of ESPN joining us. Ariel, it's uh, it's it's great to see you. Uh, great to talk to you. How's how's the family? How's the kids? How's everybody? Everyone's good. I don't see you though, so I don't know if I could say it's great to see you at the moment. I misspoke. My apologies. Probably me? a good I thing. I Probably misspoke. a good thing. I don't know. Do you see me? Do you have a camera in my house? Maybe you do. You no. Guys are... <laughs> it's like uh, I read about uh, the, there was a, a scandal in Far East baseball where they had video cameras in their <laughs> in, in their oh players' hotel rooms. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're not we're not there yet. But no, you no. cross us, Helwani. You cross us. Uh, <laughs> he would never. This is my dream. He guys. would never. Always, I would never. I'm a friend of the program. This is my dream. I've always dreamed of the day where Korean baseball and the UFC were the only two games in town, and here we are. <laughs> Ariel, exactly forgive, are. Uh, forgive me because I heard you on with good show uh, with J.D. and Ben a few days ago, and you said you were not going down to Jacksonville to cover this, but yeah. I had some follow-ups to that. Were you given the opportunity to cover this? Was this an ESPN call, a your call? Why Why are you not covering this? Uh, no, it, it, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't offered. Uh, my colleagues were, were not going, uh, and, and my bosses aren't going. Uh, I think it's a, it's a matter of trying to keep the the least amount of people in the in the arena and in the vicinity of everything as possible. And I guess they determined that you know we can cover it as best as possible from home. Obviously, we'll be missing on a few things here and there, but for the most part, do we need to be there right to cover this event? I'm doing a radio show on Saturday, much like you guys have been doing at home. So. They just kind of made that decision. So Chael isn't going. I'm not going. It, it's not like I was taking a stand. Um, I would be honest with you if you asked me, you know, if they gave me the opportunity to go, would I go? And I would probably rather stay home. I'm an extreme germaphobe. So this isn't a great time for someone like me. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of happy and relieved that they didn't, you know, present that offer to me. But it's not like I was abstaining while everyone else was going. When was the last time you didn't go to a UFC? Like, does that happen often? It doesn't seem like to me from the outside looking in that you've missed many UFC events. So North America, so look, there's 42 UFC events um, a year, but not mm -hmm. all of those are the numbered events. Like this is 249, right? right? There's fight yeah. nights. So this is a pay-per-view. North American pay-per-view. I think the last time I missed one might have been when I had my second child. Uh, I have three now, and, and he, the second one is six, so it might be six years or so since I missed the North American pay-per-view. So, yeah, it has been a while. Ariel Helwani of ESPN here on Tim and Sid. The UFC make their, what Dana White hopes to be, a triumphant return this weekend and then for another two nights. Um, it is quite the story here. Ariel, in terms of, I wanted to get into the card because this is quite something Saturday, but... I, there, there's this there's this thought in the back of my head that I cannot shake, and it's that what if Tony Ferguson on Friday hypothetically tests positive for COVID nineteen? That causes the UFC a great problem. Are they open with that information? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Well, this is how the 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 whole thing is playing out. Basically, the fighters are mostly checking in today, but Tony actually was the first one to check in. And that was on uh, Monday. When I mean check in, I mean, arrive at the host hotel in Jacksonville and go through their whole usual fight week process. And so that process now includes getting a COVID-19 test, getting the antibody test and getting your temperature check. Now the COVID-19 test is the, the now infamous one that you've probably seen online where the swab is going up the nose and it tickles your brain and all that stuff. It looks miserable. The antibody test is when they, you know, prick your finger and they draw blood. COVID-19 test, you get those results within 24 hours. The antibody test, you get those within 10 to 15 minutes. So 
the, the fighters are finding out within 10 to 15 minutes whether or not they had COVID-19. That's via the antibody test. Then you have to wait 24 hours to find out if you actually had COVID-19. But no one is getting tested every day. So by today or tomorrow, if they checked in today, we'll find out the status of all these fights. So it's not going to happen on Friday, but I get your point. What happened? On Thursday, what are they going to do? Are they going to tell us? Are they going to pull the plug? They haven't really addressed that. And that's why when people keep asking me about this fight card, especially earlier in the week and last week, asking me how I feel, I've kind of given them a bad answer. I've said, you know, I just want to see what they're doing. I want to see what the plan is because they haven't been very transparent about it. Now, thankfully, all the fighters are there, the coaches are there, the managers, and now I finally know what's going on. I, I have a good feeling as to what they are doing between now and Saturday, so I have a better understanding. But um, what I don't know is what happens if someone tests positive because as of right now, no one's tested positive. Right, and and no one, none of the leagues that are even talking about coming back, except for Korea, who said if someone tests positive, we shut it down. Like no one is saying anything about what happens when someone tests positive. The the one thing, and listen, I'm I'm with Sid. I don't want to diminish this card because it's a really good card, but there's so much intrigue to me on on why Dana White has been so aggressive in his pursuit of this, and I'm wondering, given what the backfire could look like. Why Dana at this point is willing to stake his name to all of this? First, you have to understand who he is. He is a gambler, right? And you talk about Michael Jordan, the last dance, uh, and how he liked to gamble. Dana is cut from the same cloth. I mean, this guy likes competition. He likes to gamble. Um, he's, he's someone notorious in the Las Vegas scene for gambling. Casinos have told him, thanks, but no thanks, because you keep coming here and taking all our money. So he likes that sort of thing. Also, you have to understand, this is a guy who has been grinding for 20 years. And the idea of being the only game in town, the idea of telling the NBA and the NFL, we beat you to it, or not the NFL, Major League Baseball, NHL, we beat you to it. We were able to, you know, figure this out before you guys is very appealing to him. Um, also, um, as I think we talked about, you know, when the UFC was sold in 2016 for $4 billion, no one showed up with a check for $4 billion. They have bills to pay. You know, there's a lot of investors. There's a lot of you know, financing involved with a, a sale like that. So they can't just sit on the sidelines. And also, uh, he has the luxury of, you know, unlike, he, he's not a commissioner, right? He's, he's an owner. So he's not Roger Goodell or Adam Silver, or Gary Bettman, who has to listen to a players association and a board of governors and owners and all this stuff. He could pretty much do what he wants. And if you don't want to fight, all right, it's on to the next one. It's a lot easier for him to get this done. Now, I'm not saying the fighters are mad about it per se but he doesn't have to go through that kind of process so yeah there's a ton of pressure on his shoulders from the outside looking in i mean could you imagine if someone gets sick if someone gets seriously ill you know this is not going to be a good moment in the history of the sport but he, I, he thrive off, off of this i mean looking at his interviews listening to his interviews over the last week or so this is a different guy i have said <laughs> since the, he lost some on his fastball he lost that that oomph that made dana white so popular over the past week i feel like back because he loves the idea of being a dog and proving everyone wrong. Doing it, I think it's all those reasons. I feel Ariel surprised. Helwani here on Tim and Sid. Um, I've seen Ariel Rupp. He's yeah, jacked. definitely. He's pissed <laughs> at the sure. world. I'm and he's normally pissed at the it, world. Yeah. No, but there's like an energy. Like he's just... Yeah. He's yeah. welcoming the questions like he loves. And, and I've, I've done interviews, you've done interviews with him in the past where you, you know when you hit him hard... He, he loves it. Like, he welcomes when you hit him hard. Yeah, so now he loves that everyone's... I mean, I can't yeah. ask him those hard questions anymore. Thanks for bringing it up, um, Tim. You know, I appreciate it. It's a bit of a sore <laughs> subject these days. But uh, in any event... Uh, I, I didn't bring it up. You brought it up. Well, I mean, really. Uh, who's counting? So he is that guy, and I think he's enjoying this. And I think he's going to enjoy going to Jacksonville tomorrow and... And everyone talking about him, and look, he's benefiting from the fact that he's on ESPN and they're on all these shows. It's it's truly the only North American game in town, and uh, that's a huge deal for him. So I'm really curious to see how the numbers are on Saturday. Ariel Hawani here on Tim and Sid. Ariel, I mean, if you're baseball, if you're hockey, if you're MLS, what can you take from this and apply to what you're trying to do. I guess what I'm asking is how many people are in play here in terms of quarantining and testing teams, coaches, family, broadcast crew, the works? Like, What's the rough number on how many people are, are in the mix here? Uh, man, you know, so there's 
12 fights on the card. Um, so that's 24 fighters. And each one gets three corner um, cornermen. Um, some are coming with managers and whatnot, and some are coming with family members, but they've really tried to limit that. Um, you know, they're not going to have all these fighters in the arena at the same time. Typically, you check in two to three hours before um, as far as going to the, you know, from the hotel to go to the arena on fight night. Now they're telling them they want them to, uh, to check in at, ni- at 90 minutes before. So it's considerably less time because they want to have the least amount of people at the arena as possible. And what I heard was, you know, with the ops team and TV, they're hoping that, you know, there's never more than 80 people in the actual arena um, at the same time, obviously in different locations and whatnot. Um, so it's, it's different, two fighters per locker room. Sometimes there's, you know, four or five, depending on, on the arena. Um, and then, you know, once you're done, you have to go back to the hotel and all that stuff. So it sounds like they've, they've got it down. Uh, apparently they put together this uh, 25 or so page memo that they've uh, given to the Florida State Athletic Commission on how they're going to run this. And they've also given this to the Nevada State Athletic Commission because they have those events that you mentioned on May 9th, 16th, and 23rd. But um, no, May 9th, 13th, and 16th, the 23rd is their next event. And they're hoping and praying that they could do that event in Las Vegas at their UFC Apex mm-hmm. facility, their headquarters. And if they can get Las Vegas to, or Nevada to get them to, to do these events, their life is going to be so much easier. I mean, that's a home game for them. It is going to be a gift from God. So they're, they're trying to show the commissions that they can figure this out. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of them are waiting to see how this event goes on May 9th and the 13th, and then they'll feel a lot more comfortable. But so far, so good. You know, I had my reservations, and I'm seeing tests. I didn't even know if they were going to do COVID-19 tests. They didn't ever say that. They never actually specified we were doing COVID-19 tests. Hmm. So when I see Tony Ferguson getting that swab up his nose, I feel a little better. Ariel Hawani joining us here on Tim and said, I feel like there's, I feel like we could talk for an hour on this because I'm so intrigued by it, but I, I want to get into the card because I don't want to disrespect what's going to go on in the octagon, even though it is surrounded by all this stuff. And this is part of why Dana is doing this, but it is, is Tony Ferguson risking too much in this fight when everyone in the MMA world wants Ferguson and Khabib? No, not at all. I've never subscribed to that notion because, number one, he's making more money for this fight than he's ever made in his career. And, like, fans need to get off this whole, like, legacy, title fight, blah, 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 Habib fight. At the end of the day, none of them, you know, no, none of them have to worry about cashing checks and putting food on Tony Ferguson's table and for his family. So the guy needs to fight and he needs to get paid. Um, and it's all well and good to say wait for the Habib fight, but we don't know when Habib is coming back. Is he coming back in July, like you said today? Is he coming back in September because he needs – ample time after Ramadan, who knows? So he is presented with this opportunity to fight a tough guy, to get that interim title back, um, to, to, you know, secure his place among the best at 155. He thinks he's going to win. And also Tony's a different kind of cat, man. Like this, he talk about a guy who like likes this scenario and likes being under this kind of, you know, scrutiny, the guy, you know, his team was telling me like, he sort of views this as he's Jason Bourne and he's, uh, you know, out there the whole world we all believe yeah, we're jason born a little bit ariel we all believe we're jason yeah. born just a little bit can i tell you something i've never seen this jason born film so i didn't really get the reference but i feel like you guys did so i just ran with it anyway um so i don't really know what that means like he's like a secret agent or something yeah he's like well he's he was like made in a factory kind of and then and then he turns yeah. on his captors because he has his own ideas of what humanity should be and then it's just a bunch of shooting <laughs> that's, a that's great, based i mean it's, well, so that's it's a great basically. explanation it sounds exactly like tony ferguson yeah that's exactly <laughs> how i would describe him um, you should watch it's a good a movie kind yeah. of guy yeah i probably should before the fight i keep using that analogy and i have no idea what it means um <laughs> so yeah so so you know, I don't think he's risking anything because he's going to make a lot of money. And if he wins, then the fight is even bigger. And I've never met a fighter who at least publicly went into a fight and said, I'm not going to win this fight. So in hindsight, after he loses the fight on Saturday, could you say he messed up perhaps, but I don't think he has any regrets about taking this fight at all. Ariel, did did Tony Ferguson not still make weight after the fight last month was canceled? Oh yeah. He cut the weight and everything. It's crazy. Uh, he wanted to prove a point. The best part about it was I interviewed him like an hour after. So the guy cuts weight. Also, he cut 24 pounds that week. Uh, oh on Monday, God. he weighed 179. He cut to 155 championship weight on Friday. There's no fight. Not getting paid for it. 
there was no incentive whatsoever. Justin Gaethje wasn't doing it. And he said, I wanted to do it. I wanted to prove a point, this and that. And then he said, and then I was like, okay, so what are you going to do now? He's like, oh, I'm going to treat this whole weekend like, uh, like, a, like it's a fight. Like I'm, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to do like a light workout, just like I would do if I was fighting on Saturday. I'm going to maybe do a little workout. This, I was like, wow, that's crazy. And then I said, what are you going to do Saturday night? Like at around nine o'clock when you were supposed to be fighting, he goes, I don't know, eat some ice cream or something. I was like, okay, yeah, that <laughs> totally makes sense. <laughs> you're going to treat the whole, you're going to cut 24 pounds, do the workout, all that stuff, and then eat ice cream when you were supposed to fight. Tony Ferguson for you. Ariel Hawani here on Tim and Sid. Ariel, I, um, I mean, the pay-per-view is loaded, but Anthony Pettis, Donald Cerrone on the free card at eight. Is that the best prelim fight in the history of mixed martial arts? No, I don't think so. Um, it's a good fight between, you know, two really good fighters um, who have had great careers, but there have been some really good uh, prelim cards or prelim fights in the past. You know, I was watching uh, The Last Dance on ESPN this past weekend, and there was a commercial for 249, which is kind of wild, right? Because you're thinking like, you know, five to six million people are watching, and um, it's, it's this huge deal. It's UFC 249. It's still a bit surreal for me, and they called it the best card in UFC history. I don't believe in that, and I don't believe you even have to put that on this card. It's a really good card. It's a tremendous card. Best card ever. I think that's a little much. Um, you know, Pettis, he's lost his last two. Seems like he's slowing down a little bit. Uh, Cerrone's lost his last three and was stopped in all three. Um, of course, most famously to Connor in, in January, and I kind of thought that he was doing a little too much um, and should have taken the whole year off. Uh, got his nose broken two fights ago. I mean, I just think the guy's taken a lot of damage. So on paper, two recognizable names, but combined, you know, their own five and their last five fights. I'm not saying they're journeymen or over the hill or bums or anything like that, but you know, this isn't Cowboy versus Pettis one that happened in 2013 when they were really in their primes. For me, Pettis has a lot more pressure on his shoulders because I still feel like he has a little more left in the tank and he needs to get off this winning streak. Plus he beat him quite convincingly back in 2013. So I think a nice win over Cerrone will tell people like, Hey, I'm still here. Ariel Hawani here on Tim. Go ahead, Tim. I was going to say last time we talked to you, uh, you thought that UFC 249 at a venue in California might not do as well as many folks thought. I love you. I kind of disagree with you at the time. Um, now that we've seen a WNBA draft, an NFL draft and a documentary do record numbers, do you think this could be bigger than you initially thought? from the ta what it would do at the Tachi Palace? Um, and was there any thought into Dana lowering the price on this, given how many people are unemployed right now and how that works into the equation? Yeah, so there's two answers, because I think the prelims are going to do really well. And I think having guys like Pettis and Cerrone and you know, Michelle Watterson, Great. recognizable names on the prelims, is very smart. Um, so I think the prelims, for your typical prelims, is going to do great. I, I suspect over a million viewers and all that stuff. And, and hopefully it does record numbers. It's the pay-per-view that I'm wondering about because the prelims start at 6 and they go till 10 p.m. Eastern. So that's four hours right there. I mean, that's your typical, you know, NFL game plus an hour, your typical NBA game plus 90 minutes. And so there could be people who say at that point, like, okay, I'm good. You know, thank you for the free show and uh, I'm good. As, as you just pointed out, uh, Tim, you know, tough times economically. Who's going to stick around for the extra three hours? Now, that's the main card. I get it, but it's still $65. And so, yeah, maybe there'll be a bump. But the idea that this is going to do better than a Conor McGregor pay-per-view, which is some of the stuff that I heard, to me, I just don't buy it because right. Conor is just, he's just gigantic. He's massive. Plus, that April 18th show was on the same night as that concert that they were doing, which I don't know how that did in, in, in right. retrospect. But, yeah. you know, there was some, there was some competition. Uh, there's not as much this time around. So I think it will do okay. I think the prelims will do phenomenally well. But I'm not expecting record pay-per-view numbers by any stretch. Ariel Hawani here on Tim and Sid. Finally, Ariel, before we let you go, what has been more impressive to you of the following options? One, the Last Dance documentary. Two, oh, yeah. video of Mike Tyson throwing hands with Rafael Cordero. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Or? Oh, it's just those two. I was waiting for Just the two. Sorry. No, I go yeah. to, I'm lazy. I didn't pick oh, a third. Sorry. I just want to give you two. <laughs> Come on. Wow. It, it, Tim, am I right that uh, it felt like he was, like, gearing up for a third there? Yeah, so, I was like, waiting uh, for the third. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, fake throw um, to first. Fake throw to first. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Stepped right. off the rubber. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, if, if this if this was uh, the Olympic Stadium, the uh, the chicken would be playing on the the big screen. You remember that from back in the day? <laughs> yes. Uh, you guys remember yes. that reference? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, <laughs> Man, I've loved the last dance. It's been so great. I get legitimately sad when the when the the episodes are over. It's really been a lot of fun, and it's it's been nostalgic and and just. It's, I wasn't even a Jordan fan. I hated the Bulls. I despised the Bulls. But I was a Knicks fan. I, I I adored the Knicks, and I was happy that they got a little bit of shine in the last episode. That was great. The the you know the crazy thing about the Tyson thing is that I watched that clip a gazillion times, and I'm mesmerized by the power, the speed, the ferocity. And then three days later. Someone says to me, you know that was Rafael Cordero holding the miss? I was like, what? Rafael Cordero is one of the, the best MMA coaches of all time, but like you never see these guys with boxers, let alone Mike Tyson. So I went back to the clip. I was like, holy smokes, that's Rafael Cordero. So that's when I called him up and asked him about it and all that stuff. But I, I just couldn't believe, you know, our, our two worlds don't usually, you know, uh, combine like that. So I'm fascinated by this Tyson thing. You know, do I, am I clamoring to see him fight again? No, but I'm definitely intrigued and I would be lying if I, you know, if I if I didn't admit that I would watch it if he did fight in some capacity. So I don't know. That's a really tough question. So can I pick both? I mean, you didn't give me a third option, so I'm going to pick both. How about that? How about this? This appearance on Tim and Sid. Tyson throwing hands, the last dance, or yeah. this appearance on Tim and Sid. What has impressed you the most? <laughs> well, the fact that you said that you could see me at the beginning when I didn't know yeah, this was a video. Yeah. In I kind of cre- I kind of creeped you out, didn't I? I apologize for that, Ariel. Yeah. I kind of creeped you out a little bit. Yeah, well, I'm actually standing outside right now, so I'm looking around to see if like there's like some <laughs> peeping tom. Is Jeff is Jeff in the bushes over there with binoculars? Six, What's going on over here? Six zero with the binoculars. Uh, Ariel, we always love catching up with you. Thanks for doing this, and uh, the next time you come on, we'll force you to de- to decide between Tyson throwing hands and the last dance. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All the best. Always happy to be on. And by the way. I can't believe you didn't have me on 10 year anniversary of Sid giving me the break of my life. I mean, you talk oh about a fumble God. right there. That was, that was a fumble, right? I, I swear to God, Ariel, next, time next time you're it. on ne- next week, if you can bless us with your presence, uh, we will spend eight minutes on this story because I, yeah, I love it. Like the and- Matt Damon. This is the Matt Damon, Jimmy Kimmel bit. We'll keep teasing it at yeah, the end of every interview. And never it, actually yeah, paid yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks guys. All right. Take care, brother. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye.